Isaac Brooks. One second. Sorry, something just popped up. We had Dr. Isaac Brook as our first speaker a couple of months ago, uh, talking about um, the work that he did in the Yom Kippur War and working on the soldiers. And um, that was really, you know, things that were going on then. And without that, we wouldn't really even be here now. So we appreciate the work that he did. Um, and today we have uh, Dr. Daniel Ashaim. Um, he was the Council of the Public Diplomacy for um, the Midwest uh, for Israel. But before we start, and I'm going to do a little bit better introduction to, um, to Daniel, is that we have to care, we have to take care of a little bit of men's club business. Um, when you have renewals coming up in the summer, please check the box for the men's club uh, to join. Um, so that's that for today. The mics are all going to be turned off if you're not speaking. Um, if yours is on, please turn it off. We're only going to accept questions in the chat box. Um, it'll be uh, Daniel and um, Barry Ballack that will read the questions. Uh, Barry will probably entertain them to him, or they could kind of go back and forth, whatever feels comfortable for um, either one. And Talk today's um, was listed for the, um, the Abraham Accords in the current events of Israel. Now I have to tell you when we when I first saw Dr. Shaim um, give a lecture, it was for Technion about three four months ago. I was totally blown away by the lecture. Um, I immediately emailed him that night and got a hold of him and his, and the, the people that do his scheduling to basically get him to do this event. Um, I think you guys are gonna be really excited and more or less blown away by the things that he says. And I know I'm like, you know, prepping him um, probably a little bit too much, but I, I thought it was an excellent, excellent talk. But when he did it for Technion, it was really light and fluffy and everyone was hugging each other. And I thought it was a great talk because it was so pro-Israel. And then the last two weeks happened. So I think today's talk might have a little bit different influence than it did three, four months ago. Um, and, and that's where we are in the, in the current state. So Dr. Ashaim um, serves as the Council of Public Diplomacy for the Consulate General of Israel at the Midwest. He is appointed to the Chicago-based post in September of 2020. Uh, he comes from West Africa, where he served as the Deputy Chief of Mission at the Israeli Embassy in Dakar, Senegal. As the Council of Public Diplomacy, his portfolio includes media, culture, academic, and Jewish community in the consulate's nine state Midwest regions. He holds a PhD from Hebrew University in Jerusalem, where he completed his MA in European Studies, completed his BA in Government Diplomacy and Strategy from the IDC Herzliya. During his studies, he interned at the Knesset in, um, at the British Embassy. He served at the 8200 unit, the Intelligence Corps, during his three-year service in the IDF. We are so honored to have Daniel today as our speaker. I'm just going to let him start off and um, give his presentation, and I know that everyone will extremely um, enjoy it. And thank you for being here, Daniel. Thank you very much, Lawrence, for inviting me. Thank you all for having this event, and thank you for coming. I know you have other things to do, especially usually when I do it in January, February, I tell people you don't have many better things to do than sit in your computer at home. But when the weather is so beautiful in Chicago, I know you have other alternatives. And the fact that you choose to sit this evening and listen to things about Israel is already heartwarming. So I thank you very much for joining us today. And I hope it's going to be interesting. I will start by saying, as Lawrence mentioned before, last time I, we met was in a different kind of settings, different environment, different times. Even though in Israel, every time we prepare something about current events, this is the most surprising lecture one has to make. You know, there are countries and places that you do current events. You can have the same current events in a history perspective. It could be a few months, it could be a few years, it could be a decade. That recent events are a few talking points that are returned. In Israel, you don't know the day that you're coming. Tomorrow's current events could be dramatically different than today's current events. And this is true for a week ago, 
It's true for two weeks ago, and it's especially true to what is going on now. The way I would like to do this, and I hope it will be also the way you like to do it, is I like to give a brief explanation, a little bit also, as Lawrence mentioned before, a little bit about the Abraham Accords, but I'll put them in context a little bit about the current situation and escalation that just happened now and we started the ceasefire, so you are probably following the news carefully, and also a little bit about what we did here and what is the public opinion that the way I see it here in the Midwest and what can be done and what are the challenges that we are facing as Israel, as the consulate, which are very disturbing here currently. I'm going to try and localize it the most possible. And I'll start by saying what I said in the beginning. I really hope that this is going to be one of the last presentations in these black cubes. I mean, I live 15 minutes walk from your shul. I live in Lakeview, Belmont, very close to you. So I hope I'll be able to come physically for the next time. I hope I'll be invited. It will be physically seeing all of you together in the community. So a little bit about the Abraham Accords. What are the Abraham Accords? So the Abraham Accords is what is ref Israel refers to and the world refers to as the new historic agreements between Israel, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Sudan, and Morocco. Now, a lot of people say, you know, yeah, this is not a peace agreement because there never was a war between Israel and these countries. That's correct. But I'm sorry if Lawrence, you already heard this, but this is something I feel it's important for me to emphasize this. In 2015, I went with my wife on a honeymoon and we went to the Maldives. It was a beautiful vacation, but we wanted to go on the way to this place that we only heard about in, in the movies. It's like the Las Vegas of the Middle East or the New York of the Middle East. United Arab Emirates, Dubai, these very cool places. And unfortunately, it says very clearly on all the websites there, entrance is permitted for every country, for every citizens besides Israeli citizens, loud and clear, written everywhere. And you know, for a vacation destination that it says clearly that you're not invited, this was before I worked in the ministry. And I decided to look into this and we said we had both the foreign passports, so with that we could work, and we came in. It was not a great experience because of the fear, but eventually it was a nice vacation. I'm running forward a few years, 2020, 2021. Out of my 15 friends, five of them already traveled with Israeli passports to the UAE. Two other friends of mine are doing official business investments between the UAE and Israel. Another friend of mine, is currently doing research and development between the two countries in the various fields. I mean, we are witnessing astonishing changes which are occurring in front of our, our eyes. And these historical agreements actually say that we are here to build bilateral agreements, not only on the fields of security, what we usually hear, Iran and these kind of things, which I'm gonna talk about, but we are talking about cultural ties, economic ties. We are talking about connections in the fields of research and development, academic relationship. Well, I mentioned it in the Technion presentation. This is true to all the different academic institutions. The potential here is so high, and it's not only in the level of potential. This is important to emphasize. Israel's agreements with Egypt and Jordan, which were historical and really ended active war. So they are even more important. Nevertheless, the tragedy here was the fact that these historical agreements remained agreements between leadership and then between the security forces and the governments. And it never went down to earth, to people to people, community to community, and relationships which are built on much more profound manners that can stay also after a certain leader moves or a certain regime falls. And the relationship stayed very strong between Israel and Egypt and Israel and Jordan. Nevertheless, it never came in Egypt today. It's still illegal to translate a book into Hebrew. Unfortunate, but it's the truth. It's not allowed to do by law, by the guild law of the, of the Egyptian writers or theater or actors to be in any cultural involvement is, with Israel. And here we see historical agreements which bring us to a different era in the Middle East. Not less than that, I don't want to, it sounds like I'm exaggerating, but I'm not exaggerating. The fact that Israel has strong relationship today with Sudan, 
where in Khartoum, they said in 67, all the Arab leagues sat there and said no to negotiation, no to recognition, no to discussions with anything to do with Israel. And this is a country that signs a normalization agreement with the Jewish state, the state of Israel, acknowledged not behind the scenes. This is a lot of work of behind the scene diplomats. And then leadership, true leadership. Now we can say whatever we want about the certain leaders. I'm sure you have very firm thoughts about President Trump, former President Trump, about Prime Minister Netanyahu, about the, the Arab leaders. It's all legitimate. You can have whatever you think about them. Nevertheless, the steps that they did by doing these things are worth mentioning because it's true leadership position. Now, it's not only the leadership. Of course, there are certain interests that come together here. What I mentioned before, the Iranian threat, Iran is currently the most problematic actor in the world in the means of destabilizing. What they're doing is destabilizing the Middle East. And by destabilizing the Middle East, what they're trying to do is eliminate Israel from the map. But not only Israel. This is something that's also relevant to the moderate Sunni Arab countries. We see that in Saudi Arabia, they have a proxy war there in Yemen. They are helping terrorist groups like Hezbollah, Hamas, they're arming them, they're funding them, all to destabilize the region. And the moderate countries such as Bahrain and such as UAE are understanding this, they're realizing this, and therefore they're looking at new allies and they see Israel as a true ally who is working side by side together with them on, on security issues, the Iranian threat, and all the other civil opportunities that I mentioned before that are going to be game changers in Israeli economy, in Middle Eastern economy. It's going to help Israeli Arabs in a dramatic way. Think about the, the amount of tourists, wealthy tourists coming to Arab destinations in Israel, Arab tourists that can go there. The language is Arabic, so a lot of investments can be in the Arab sector and the high tech in the Arab sector. So many different opportunities which are really game changers. So this comes in a time where we are saying peace is here. We are looking at the new Middle East, really, and with Morocco also, it's not Middle East, but it's also tremendous opportunities there. And when we are looking at this new world that is forming in front of our eyes, we are looking at this thing that still exists, which is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And what changed here is the fact that this was the first time that the Arab countries agreed to do these Arab countries agreed to sign on peace agreements with Israel, putting aside the Palestinian issue. So both the Egyptian and Jordan agreements had something to do with the Palestinian matter, even though it was not really implicated in the, on the ground, but it was mentioned. Here it was not even mentioned. Now, does this eliminate the Palestinian-Israeli conflict? Definitely not. But this is a game changer also here because this needed to indicate to the Palestinian leadership that you have two options, trying again to beat Israel through terrorism or through other means of diplomatic warfare in the United Nations, or look at the other direction and see Israel as partners for peace work, even though it's very tough. And I know there are many different topics involved. It's not the same. We don't have with the UAE territorial disputes. We don't have other, other issues like we have with the Palestinians, very clear, it's different issues. Nevertheless, the matter of fact remains that they need to see Israel as a partner for peace and it's going to change their future. And the fact is that they chose the minute after these agreements were signed to disconnect their relationship with the United States of America. This only resumed month after saying America dumped us, Israel is not looking at us, and what we are gonna do in order to combat that is not talk not to the Americans and, and they disconnected all ties with Israel, including security ties and more. It, it resumed after. But these were opportunities were again missed by the Palestinian leadership and I think this is a tragedy. It's a tragedy because the Palestinian people, I don't wanna speak here with slogans. You've heard slogans enough and we hear we have the talking points. I don't wanna get in talking points. But there is something substantial here. The fact that Palestinian leadership throughout the years did not acknowledge that they it's in their interest to come to a peaceful resolution with Israel and saying all the time, no, 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 no. 
to any compromise, whether it's the Camp David agreements, whether it's Annapolis agreements, whether it's, it's Oslo Accords, just saying no is exactly the opposite from the successful Zionist, I would say, I wouldn't say ideology, it's the, the Zionist project. What they said in the Zionist project was, you know, this is not what we want. We'll say yes, but the Palestinians say no, no. And this is the problem, problem the problematic aspect is the much as I see it. Because they could have said, you know what? Yes, but we have problem with this and this and this. But saying no immediately in cutting relationship is a tragedy which brings the cycle and continues it more and more and more, which brings us to current affairs, what we just witnessed now. What did we witness now? Now, what we saw here were two things. First of all, domestic Palestinian matters, which were elections that were called by Mahmoud Abbas, the, the PLO leader, saying they want finally to have elections in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip for the Palestinian leadership, Hamas against the Palestinian Authority and Fatah. And it was canceled last minute. And here Hamas wanted to show who is the boss. And they were also, they tried to do everything possible to bring unrest to Jerusalem. So I was sitting with my family for Shabbat dinner a day before I returned. I was just visiting there two weeks ago. It was a great vacation, showed my daughter to my parents. They saw her, their grandchild, it was very exciting. And we sat, we have a beautiful balcony overlooking the old city in Jerusalem. And the whole night of Friday, we heard sirens and we heard, uh, we saw fireworks shot at policemen. And these were not unplanned riots, were not spontaneous uprisings. Why am I saying that? Because the, the full three weeks before, there were Muslim prayers in the holy month of Ramadan in the Temple Mount, and nothing happened. And then suddenly, with a few words brought out there, you see thousands of people with stones, rockets, flammable bottles, throwing them at policemen, looking for unrest. And this was combined with other incidents happening at the same time in Jerusalem. You can say they are connected. I think they were not connected. Of course, everything is connected in this conflict, but they were different issues. But Hamas, as a matter of principle, from their own reasons, there may be different and varied reasons, decided to escalate the situation, decided to throw more matches into the fire. And what we experienced there is out of nowhere, Hamas shoots exactly when I landed in Chicago. I don't know if it's me bringing it or not. Hopefully I'm not connected. But the minute I landed in Chicago, a missile was shot. A rocket was shot in the Jerusalem direction, bringing all my family to shelters. The next moment, Tel Aviv was bombarded with bringing all my friends and families to shelter. And then the rest of the country was bombarded for a full week by Hamas terrorist group that aims and says clearly, we are gonna stop the Israeli occupation. From them, Israeli occupation means 1948 occupation, which is a very, very important point, which is gonna lead me to today's discussion in the Midwest. Conf to determinate what they are doing, one has to understand this point, when they are saying that 48 is the occupation, that we know they wanna distract the state of Israel. And Israel, using its right for self-defense, with the firm support of President Biden's administration and Secretary of State Blinken, that reiterated this message once and more, despite having pressures also in the certain wings in the Democratic Party, claiming we understand Israel's right for self-defense. It's a legitimate and moral right. And the moral differentiation one needs to do here because we always, we were, we were always, people said Israel is killing more civilians than killed in Israel. This is not balance. What is Israel doing? And the answer for this is pretty clear and easy. Eventually Hamas targeted and targets Israeli civilians as the more civilian casualties, the more successful their attempts are. And thank God or not thank God, I would say thank God, thank the United States of America and thank the developers in Israel we have the Iron Dome protection system, which actually took away, that there were 4,500 missiles shot at Israeli schools, houses, kindergartens, and other centers. Just imagine if we wouldn't have had the Iron Dome, which stopped approximately 90 to 90% of these rockets from falling. 
would have been talking about hundreds and hundreds of civilian casualties in Israel. And Israel, when it retaliates and uses its right for self-defense, does something completely different. They are doing everything possible to prevent civilian casualties. We phone the buildings before we bomb them. They are using, and what Hamas is doing here are two things. They are doing two war crimes. On the one hand, they are shooting at civilians in Israel. That's the first very brutal war crime. And the second is they are using their civilian population as human shields, shooting rockets from civilian centers, from hospitals, from schools, from commercial centers. So thinking that Israel, they know that Israel does not retaliate there, it does not want to hurt civilians. And they are shooting from there, and they're actually jeopardizing and they're hijacking the civilian population of the Gaza Strip for their own interest, whether political interest or any other interest that they have. Ideological, doesn't matter. And by doing so, Israel in their operation tried to be very, very surgical and find exactly those places, the tunnels, the underground tunnels, they call it the metro, the underground system that were built under the Gaza Strip. Just imagine the budgets. We're talking about billions of dollars given to them with foreign aid, which were used to build underground tunnel system, which is, is similar to the Paris metro system. Just imagine how much money that costs and how much time is it, and efforts are dedicated to that. And of course, to get more technologies for more missiles, more rockets. And then there were discussions about ceasefire. What is a ceasefire? How to do a ceasefire? Israel some, says something very clear here. A ceasefire that will last another month, another five months, another year is not a ceasefire. It's time for Hamas that they use to get more weapons, more technologies, and do nothing to improve their population's life. And these are times that Hamas has the option here to either, and I'm, it's very unfortunate that they're ones controlling there, but they are. So if I want to see them controlling there, no, but they are there de facto and they are ruling the Gaza Strip. And they have still the option to use these millions of dollars of aid to feed their population, to build technology centers. It could have been a tourism resort on the Mediterranean Sea. Instead of being a heaven for tourists, it became a terrorist haven on the shores of the Mediterranean. And this can still change. And I really hope and I pray every day, I pray that there will be peace and that the Palestinian people and Israelis will learn to live next to each other. And for me as a human being, as a Jew, as an Israeli, seeing every life lost is a tragedy, whether Palestinian, Jew, Jewish, Muslim, Christian, Israeli, doesn't matter for me. When a civilian is killed, it's a tragedy, regardless of what happens. The question here, is what is the cause and the effect, what leads to what? And I'm differentiating between the humanitarian causes and saying this is a tragedy and putting the responsibility and who is leading to this tragedy. These are two different things which we have to separate. Which leads me to the last point. I wanna, don't wanna to speak too much because I really wanna open it for your questions. So I'll finish with the mid Midwest part. During the last week and a half, the team at the consulate and myself were very, very busy with trying to get as many press interviews as possible, briefing politicians, congressmen, uh, communities, federations, and everything we could in order to bring the Israeli truth to the story and to bring our side. And what we experienced in this operation that we never experienced in the past is very, very worrying. And this is true for the Midwest, and it's not true only for the Midwest, it's true for other parts of the United States as well. We are seeing on the political front, despite having a lot, a lot of support from most of the Democratic and Republican Party, we see certain voices that we've never heard before, which are amplified through the social media networks, which are getting even more and more and more by politicians. We are hearing from celebrities who are giving sound bites explaining the conflict in very, very simplistic and mostly false claims. Israel ethnic cleansing, Israel apartheid. When you repeat it and you don't base it, it becomes for many people the truth. It's very sad, but it's the truth. And we see this repeating itself. We see, we saw what Bela Hadid, a very famous model wrote and other celebrities also here in Chicago who wrote it and they get hundreds of thousands of likes, shares, and exposure to millions of people around the world. We also see 
much less demonstrations of the Jewish communities of support demonstration. This is the truth. It's, a, it's, a, it's hurting, but it's the truth. We used to see many, many more. We are seeing less and less for various reasons. I'm not going to get into that. We are seeing the press, which tried to be in previous times showing much more than both of the sides, were extremely, 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 now I'm talking specifically about mid, middle, Midwest, one-sided here. I monitored it every day. I did interviews myself for about 30, 30 television stations in Chicago and all around the Midwest, radio stations. Consul General Aviv Ezra did 40 others. We, we were really out there. And even in the articles where we were there, it was portrayed as the strong against the weak. And all the headlines, most of the, the vast majority of the headlines showed Israel's bombardment of the Gaza Strip without any context. And when it did show context, it tried to show a false context connected to Jerusalem and not other things which were really in Hamas interest. And this reality on the ground, where in campuses, the young Jewish students are coming to the campus and our opponents there, the so-called pro-Palestinian, but I think they're much more anti-Israel than pro-Palestinian, but that's for another discussion, SJP and more, come to this Jewish students. Think about it, you know it from your families much better than I. You have your grandchildren, your children, who have children, and they go to and she met, they go to the Sunday school, they go to summer camps, they go to you know, other places, where they go to family, they visit Israel, they go to very various programs, and then they come to campus, and then they know themselves that they are liberal, progressive Jews who are firm supporters of Israel and Zionists, and then they are forced to choose. They're being told, wait, are you, you guys, are you for Black rights? Are you for LGBTQ rights? Are you for women equality? Are you for the environment? Are you for animal rights? If the answer is yes, then you cannot be pro-Israel. Are you pro-Israel? Then you can't be with us. And they're forced to choose in this very, very problematic course makes our future very, very difficult. And I'm not exaggerating because this is very, very worrying. I, have pres I speak to groups in campuses on a weekly basis here in Chicago and outside in the Midwest, through the Hillels and through federations and separately. And I hear from them. The other side is very clear, very firm about their things. And our side decides when dealing with Israel, also, it happens also in, 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 in synagogues, also very Zionist synagogues. They hear because of political issues, Israel, and you know it better than me again, I'm sure it happens also in certain discussions you have. Israel ain't what it used to be in public opinion, also in synagogues. It used to be bringing Israel, used to be the most consensual matter possible. You'd speak about Chagim, you speak about other things, you speak about Israel. Israel is becoming a contested matter also in the Jewish community and also in American politics. And the fact that it became a contested matter brings many communities, we, you are obviously not because we are speaking today, but many other communities to decide not to tackle the hard talking points, not to ask the tough questions, not to discuss the relationship between Israel and the non-Orthodox uh, forms of Judaism. All of these talking points, all of these points are completely relevant and there are a lot of issues to talk about. A lot of things are not perfect. There are a lot of things to improve in the relationship. There are a lot of different things. Nevertheless, the fact that people choose to discuss hummus and Idan Reichel music when they're only discussing Israeli matters because everyone likes hummus and everyone likes Idan Reichel does not solve this problem. And putting a Band-Aid on it does not mean it solved the opposite. That's what I believe. And therefore I try every way possible with every group that I have, and I'm saying this to you, if you know of other groups to talk to, I'd be very happy. The younger the generation is, the better. Because your generation, most of the people I see here, came to a different reality. Your parents' generation came from different places around the world with a different knowledge of the threats existing. Israel is a homeland. Your generation built, worked very hard. Your children's generation, your grandchildren's generation are coming to a different America and different relationship with Israel. And these things need to be talked upon, talked about. 
Keeping them aside does not solve them. And we need to discuss them. And I also want to say a lot of times I hear also, yes, because of the right-wing government and we are supporters of the left, everything is true. But one has to remember, if I disagree with a certain US administration, does that mean that I can't support the United States? It's an obvious answer. Of course I can. So Israel is not only the certain Israeli government at a certain point, like America is not. And Israel also have diff has different parties inside its government, which have different opinion. You see it in various matters, even on the annexation. You saw that the prime minister had one voice, the other right-wing parties had another. Then you had the foreign minister saying that he's against annexation and the defense minister. So what is Israel? Who is Israel? The same with the Orthodox, the reform communities, the conservative communities, these discussions are going all over and there are many different things to say about them. But it's the most important message for you and your communities is be involved. Don't be indifferent to what is happening in Israel. You can argue, you can love, you can hate, you can, you can love everything you hear and you can disagree with everything you hear, but be involved. Make your children involved, make your friends involved. Talk to your congressman, talk to the press, write op-eds, discuss these topics, sign petitions, discuss it, whatever, but be involved. And this is my message to you. And I think I gave, this is an overview, it took a bit long, but I wanna hear really from you to open the floor in the time that we still have for your questions. It could be about anything I mentioned now, it could be about not related things, not connected things, about any topic, connected to Israel, Jewishness, whatever you feel like talking about, I'm open to everything. And again, thank you for being here and being interested and I'm looking forward to your questions. Barry, you have to unlock your microphone. Your microphone. Yes. Uh, thank you for your candid remarks, Daniel. Uh, very informative and uh, We've had a number of questions that are coming in through the chat. Um, I'd like to begin with the ones in regard to the Abraham Accords, uh, because that was uh, where you began. <laughs> and uh, a number of the questions are very similar. Uh, that is, uh, do you think the Abraham Accords uh, helped to uh, to bring the current conflict to a quicker uh, ceasefire? Um, and also, do you see, uh, or do you see some negative impact from the current conflict in regard to the countries that are already involved with the Abraham Accords? So it's a good question. I, look, I don't think it brought a quicker end. I don't think it also impacted it and made it, I don't think it had a lot to do with it directly. What it did have to do is in the back of the head, knowing that we have new friends in the region, which are Muslim Arab friends who are supporting Israel and are friends of Israel. And you also saw in the remarks of the, the countries, the surrounding countries did not, what they used to do in the past, condemn Israel immediately, say Israel is right, but they were pretty quiet here. Of course, they called for ceasefire, but there, you could see in the terminology that it's, it changed the terminology in the region. And this is important and dramatic, even though it's only terminology. But no, I don't think it had a direct impact one to either direction. You see, uh, this is a question from Alan Mintz. Do you see that uh, since Israel is such a major player with third world countries in economics and trade and providing goods and services, do you see uh, that increasing, you see the Abraham Accord spreading to additional Arab countries in the near future? Great, thank you for the question. So I served, I had the opportunity, I came here in September for after being two years, the deputy Israeli ambassador to Senegal and four other West African countries. So I, I worked personally on many, many of these projects and I was proud to really initiate a special project which was then chosen by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs as a flagship project in Senegal. What we did there was we tried making Senegal the startup nation of Africa by 2025 by using the Israeli know-how and models. And what we really did is we really built the ecosystem for innovation that didn't exist there through leadership programs, through experts from Israel. We took all the actors there, brought them together 
And of course, this is aside from the regular Mashav, which is Israel's international development agency, the programs in water management, agriculture, healthcare, education, women empowerment, which currently Israel leads in 103 countries around the world. If you're interested, I'll be happy to be invited to talk about Israel in Africa. I do that to various communities. I speak about what Israel does for Africa and how does international development play foreign policy in today. A lot of people don't know a lot about it. And I think it's very interesting, but it takes too long. I'll just say that the Abraham Accords, it's true that on the one hand, the relationship were built with very strong economies. On the other hand, Sudan, which is much weaker. And of course, the more relationship we have, with, the better it is. And the diplomacy works differently. So the diplomacy with the developing world are based on a lot of development, development diplomacy, which means you're working, what you're giving is aid, international aid, humanitarian aid. But what we are doing is train the trainers. We're giving them know-hows. We are give, teaching them how to fish and not giving them the fish. And this is really part of our ideology and diplomacy. Thank you. So um, just a, a quick comment uh, of my own. We were talking before the formal uh, discussion about Zoom and its positive wow. and negative aspects. I attended a lecture from Technion last week. And a lot of people may not realize it, but the main developer of Zoom is an Israeli. So I just wanted to get that out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, another uh, question about that you touched on is in, in regard to uh, the younger generation in the United States. Um, what, what do you advise those people that don't necessarily agree with uh, every uh, policy that Israel has, that they may disagree uh, actually deeply with many of the extreme right-wing policies of the current Israeli government, yet they, uh, they still have a deep desire to show uh, support for Israel. How can they express their opinions and not be labeled in some way as anti-Israeli? Look, it's a very good point, and it's a very delicate point as well. I had the privilege of about, in the, about three months ago to hold an event with the University of Chicago's, University of Illinois, uh, Professor Carrie Nelson and myself, discussing with the head of the discussion was, can you be liberal, progressive, and pro-Israeli? And we discussed all these matters with faculty, with students, and many more. It's a, it's a complicated matter. The first of all, the answer is yes, you can be. You can be and you should be. Whether there are disagreements with certain policies of the government, there could definitely be. They don't need to be the MFA, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Israeli diplomats. Doesn't mean that I agree with every policy of the government. I'm representing it. Doesn't mean that I agree with every one of it. Nevertheless, one has to differentiate between agreeing with every policy of the government. Again, I'm coming back to what I said before. If I disagreed with certain policies of President Trump, I disagreed, does that mean I can't love the United States of America? I think everyone will say to you, of course not. You can disagree with these and these policies. The same thing about Israel. You can like certain policies, you can dislike. But my problem is that the, the only country in the world that the discussions about it come to existential questions in campuses, in liberal progressive campuses with top-notch professors from around the world. And the topic is, it's not written officially like that, but then barely, does Israel have the right to exist or not? These are discussion, academic discourse. It's not exactly called like that. They call it a bit more subtle, but these are the discussions. And there is no other country, even let's say North Korea, I'm not comparing us to North Korea, but let's say North Korea, which violates a lot, a lot of human rights and it's acknowledged by all. Are there academic discussions and debates sitting and saying, should North Korea exist or not? No, and it shouldn't be. There are discussions whether certain policies of North Korea are they humane, not humane. And should they change certain aspects of their foreign policy or domestic policy? All yes, but there aren't discussions about Iran or North Korea or Syria. Should they exist? And I don't think there should be discussions. But when it comes to Israel, it's legitimate to hold academic conventions and, and, and really 
they have affairs discussing between two scholars. Yes, I think Israel should. The other ones, no. Israel is colonialist, fascist, Zionist, uh, apartheid, ethnic cleanser, everything you can imagine. And the problem is that the use, and I also see it here, there were demonstrations here in Chicago, large demonstrations, and you hear them. I was in a debate in Fox 2 Detroit a few days ago. You can see, you, I'm inviting you all, you can be my friends on Facebook. I'll approve you with pleasure and I'll put in my, I'll just put in the chat here, my, if you have it, just a moment. And you can see in my Facebook page profile, you can see there all the links to the argument and to the articles and interviews that we held. And why is that important? Because there we can really see here, I put it here. Uh, this is my Facebook. You can see I put actively the interviews that we are holding and more. And you see the dialogue and you see the discussion. What are the points raised? So we are being said, Israel apartheid, Israel ethnic cleansing. And it's just thrown there. And it's repeated and repeated and repeated. It started to be used by the anchors. They start referring to those things. And my discussion needs to start by saying Israel, why Israel is not an apartheid or ethnic cleanser. Now, again, there could be a lot of criticism about certain Israeli policies. My father was born and raised in South Africa, in apartheid South Africa. He's now 79. He was born and raised into a reality that he was so disgusted from that he and his friends became firm Zionists coming to Israel to change the way they see their lives there. And he also has a lot of criticism and his friends about Israel. But you can hear what he said when people are saying Israel is an apartheid state, he's disgusted. And it's truly so because it's so different from every aspect, from the fundamental aspect, from the moral aspect, from the practical aspect. And again, there could be discussions and, and disagreements, but one has to differentiate between truth, false narratives and, and shallowness of discussions. Look, what are we having now? You think I have the opportunity to discuss in the press, in social media? There is no option. There are no options to do so. It's sound bites. They say a word, you respond. You respond, they say a word. It shallows and narrows down the discussion and in sound bites and pictures, the house falling in Gaza will always beat the room in Shderot, always. And therefore we need as many supporters as possible to portray and por convey our message that it's a complex matter and our narrative is not less legitimate than the other narrative. And we have a lot of truth that are with us and moral values that are with our side and the truth is in many of the different arguments that we are saying. Yeah, thank you. Um, one of the things that I've noticed, and this conflict is not certainly not the first time, that uh, when the media talks about Hamas, uh, sometimes they mention that they're terrorists, sometimes not. But I have yet to hear the media indicate that Hamas is basically a a puppet of Iran. So do you think there's a reason that the media don't emphasize the relationship between Iran and Hamas? Yes, I look, I think it's pretty clear. I think what we are seeing here is when a certain narrative come, comes in and the narrative that is shown in most of the media, and I'm not one of the, per, I'm not a person that complains about media. I think a media, they're doing their job I think we, it's our job to convince the media that they are wrong. But I don't think it's the media as a media as an entity. But most of the media, when we are seeing the coverage of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, what we are seeing is a certain narrative that they decide to take. They decide already in advance that the aggressor here is Israel because of the certain context and the way they see it. And if you're putting Hamas and Iran in the same place, which they are, but if you portray it, it means there's a different story here. It's not anymore the, the weak against the strong, the colonialists, uh, fascists, apartheid, ethnic cleanser against the weak, uh, poor Palestinians. It becomes a clash of civilizations as more clever people than me said in the past. Or it becomes uh, the, the extremists versus moderates. And then they're good guys, bad guys. And then it becomes the axis of evil. What the, it becomes back to the Bush days. So mm. why should we put that? Why should we show this complex story? It ruins the narrative, it really does. 
if you showed that, but it's the truth. Of course, look, the Hamas, Hamas would have maybe existed without Iran. Iran is supporting them financially, morally, and technically, which is a very problematic aspect. Why is it problematic? Because if we look at Hamas's agenda, wiping off the state of Israel, they have small missiles which ruin their daily life, but they're not an existential threat. Whereas Iran is trying to develop nuclear weapons which are devastating and existential. Mm. Yeah. Um, so a, a question that uh, has come up before, um, and uh, I thought I would save this for tonight. Um, so knowing that uh, Hamas is so heavily supported by Iran, and knowing that Israel watches the border they share with Gaza so closely and the Mediterranean so closely, where are all these weapons coming from? How do they get in? So this is a very important point. A lot of the weapons are already manufactured there. They brought in technologies. Some of them are very primitive and easily built. Just imagine the difference. Every Iron Dome missile costs about $60,000, wherever their missiles cost $20, $100. So they are very, some of them are very primitive. Some of them are more sophisticated and they're also built there. And some of them are also imported. But the most of the imported ones are, I think the imported ones are less, are smaller in amounts. And these, this is also the problem. Why can we not do, everyone talks afterwards about rebuilding Gaza. The problem is and was when you rebuild Gaza, what happened was that the steel, the metal, the, the every everything, the, the stones was were used instead of for building, they were used for building underground tunnels and for weapon manufacturers. And we need to guarantee that the things that come into the Gaza Strip, as you mentioned correctly, Barry, are going to be used not for dual use but for one use, which is the purpose of the use, which is building hospitals and building schools. And until this mechanism is not formed, one cannot really rebuild Gaza. And this is what we are trying to, to, to work on. And as now Minister of Defense said, we want to rebuild Gaza, but we need, first of all, we have some people in captivity there who are kidnapped and they are there. They need to come back, be released by Hamas. And then we need to talk about a mechanism that will guarantee that the money doesn't go to the terrorists, but goes for the people, the civilian population of Gaza. Mm. So I was reading today that Abbas would love to be the supervisor of those funds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, this who is, who yeah. would you, do you have any recommendations? I mean, the United States right now is considering how big of a check to write for rebuilding Gaza. Who the do problem, you yeah. think should supervise those efforts? And should Israel be directly involved in rebuilding Gaza? And would Hamas allow Israel to be directly involved? Look, Israel in 2005, in a unilateral step, they left the Gaza Strip to the last inch. And we gave the greenhouses that were left, the roads that were left. The first thing the Hamas did, the Palestinians did there, was to destroy the greenhouses, destroy the roads, leaving that aside. Israel left the Gaza Strip. It didn't want to be responsible for the future of the Gaza Strip. Nevertheless, it was imposed on us once and again to be involved there. Now, whether Israel has a, some aspects to do with redoing or remaking, rebuilding the Gaza Strip, Israel, of course, will be involved. There are also the border crossings. Israel allows uh, different trucks getting in with humanitarian aid. And of course, it will be a, partner, a party here. Is Israel going to put the money for it? No. There'll be different international partners who guarantee to do it, who promise to do it, who can do it, who are capable of doing it. And we need to make sure that the mechanism, as you mentioned, who exactly on the practical level, I don't know, this needs to be by experts to see, to make sure and validate that it will work. We have bad experiences from different international forces in certain areas. It was in the past in Lebanon, problematic in other places. So we need to make sure that an international mechanism is a true mechanism that guarantees that the money goes to where it should go and the supplies go to where they should. Hmm. Very much so. Um, so uh, we've had several questions come up about what the current status of the property dispute is in East Jerusalem. 
Could you give okay. an update on that? Yeah, so this, this is really, a, this is a more challenging issue. We are talking about Sheikh Jarrah, which is a neighborhood in East Jerusalem, that there are property disputes between two parties. One party are families of Palestinian origin who are East, live in East Jerusalem. So Palestinians living in East Jerusalem, Arabs living in East Jerusalem, and who lived there in these buildings when the Jordanians occupied the area, they gave them the houses as tenants. So they never bought the house, but they're living there. On the other hand, there are family or the descendants of Jews who bought the properties in the 19th century or the 20th century. They have the original buying slip. They have all the information about it. But the claim is that according to Israeli law, which means the law which dealt with the, what happens with the property left by Palestinians who left in 48 to different countries, it says that if they were not, if they did not stay, it becomes land property or the person who owned it before. And here, this is, this is in courts back and forth in the courts about who owns this house. And it came to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court needs to rule still about this specific building and this dispute between the parties. It's not, it's not a dispute between the state of Israel and the Arab population there, but it's between those who owned the building before and those who lived there. Now, of course, in Israel, every property issue becomes a national issue, international issue, it becomes a Jews, Muslim things, Arabs, Jews, Palestinian, Israeli, but eventually it's a, it's a dispute about property. And a lot of parties are taking advantage of it to use it for the sake of their own interests, which are like we saw with Hamas. Hamas wants to show that they are the kings of Jerusalem, the leaders of Jerusalem, and they want to disconnect the, the fact that the Judea and Samaria is one area, the West Bank one area, and Gaza another area. They want to bring them all together into their struggle, their fight to destroy stability, to destroy coexistence, and doing everything possible to inflate the area. So is there any indication when the Supreme Court will rule on this issue? So they asked the, the state, because of this before, before the Gaza operation started, they tried everything possible to to lower the tensions there. And they asked for very special requests from the government. They requested the Supreme Court to postpone the discussion in 30 days, and they agreed to do so. So it's going to be in the next uh, few days. Hopefully, it will remain calm, and both parties will agree to what the Supreme Court is doing. It, it could be precedent setting because of all the, I mean, there's so many properties on both sides. I would think that could be matters of contention, no? There are, even though the Israeli law, Israeli law claims that those who the Arabs who lived before are not entitled to because it's a Jewish state. So these are these are already issues which are connected to to the law, similar to the law of return, which are giving certain certain privileges to certain population. And but these are still it's disputes which are on specific areas. So most of the other areas are not under dispute. There are certain areas in East Jerusalem that are disputes on them. I see. Yeah, thank you for clearing that up. That's been kind of an ambiguous area in the media. I'm not sure why again, but it has been. It, because it's complicated, again, Barry. <laughs> complicated matters don't get media attention, it's true. They are simplified. You're simplifying by saying Jews are evacuating Arabs. Israel is evacuating Palestinians. Uh, yeah. That's it, it finishes. And then your response needs to be yes, no, in two seconds. And it's very hard doing it in a soundbite. Look, I was interviewed 15, 20 minutes to some of the I, to some of the news shows in the news networks. And then you have four seconds in the good case that is shown eventually in news. Yeah. So, and they take, they choose which soundbite is chosen. So no, that's how I it is. Totally understand. So I think uh, I'm gonna, just give you one last question. And I so appreciate your candor tonight and for uh, giving us some insights into a lot of these issues. 
for the reason you just said, the media just seems to be so lax in terms of giving the depth to what's happening in the Middle East. Um, and uh, our, our last question is a general question, and that is, what can American jewelry do? What can we do to help achieve peace in the area? So as I mentioned before, the most important, the way I see it is staying involved, hearing, asking, writing, visiting, hearing, talking, agreeing, disagreeing, being with people who care, urge other people to care, write to people, urge your congressmen and women to work accordingly and be interested and engaged. The more events, the more discussions, the more meetings, the more engagements, the better it is, the stronger our relationship will be, the stronger the bond will be, and the closer peace will come. Well, Daniel, thank you again. Uh, thank you so much on behalf of the Men's Club of Anchi Emmet, the congregation. We had several people from FJMC, the Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs across the country that were joining us tonight as well. And uh, we all wish you much success in your endeavors. And may we only continue to hear good things, successful, peaceful things coming from Israel. Thank you. Amen. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, Thank you for pleasure. interesting questions. And I really I look forward to meeting you all in person that would in the be very good. near future. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Bye-bye. Good night now. Bye-bye.